In John Steinbeck's novel from 1947, titled The Wayward Bus, a dilapidated old bus takes a cross-country shortcut on his journey from Sacramento to Los Angeles and gets stuck in the mud. It's in a treacherous mountain region of Central California. While the drivers go for assistance, some of the passengers take refuge in a cave. It's a curious hodgepodge of people. There's the lost and the lonely, the good and the greedy, the stupid and the scheming, the beautiful and well-meaning, and the vicious and self-serving. The reader begins to understand that this is meant to be a cross-section of humanity. We also understand the author is attempting to get across the point that these people are lost spiritually as well as literally. As the distraught passengers enter the cave of the shelter, Steinbeck calls the reader's attention to the fact that overhead there's a word scrawled across the rocks with paint. The word is repent. It's written in large letters and right over the entrance. Repent. Interesting how none of the passengers pay the least bit of attention to, the, to this symbolic gesture whatsoever. They all may be running away from their shattered dreams and anxious of having a better future, yet none heed the simple answer provided to them above their heads that will solve their problems. What is repentance? In terms of salvation, it's the sinner's recognition and acknowledgement of his or her lost condition and the need for grace from Jesus Christ. But it's more than this. In Greek, it's pronounced metahoia. It literally means to be given a new heart and mind from above. To repent is to change one's attitude and mind toward self, toward sin, toward God, and toward Christ. We express sincere regret or remorse about our wrongdoings with a desire to change. We change our hearts so that we may align our limited, unenlightened perspective with that of the higher divine perspective of the Almighty. The first word of the gospel is not love. It's not even grace. The first word of the gospel is repent. Here are some examples. When we look at Matthew 3, it says, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert region of Judea and proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. First thing out of his mouth. Not only is that word the dominant theme throughout John's ministry, even after he gets thrown in jail by King Herod for embarrassing Herod for taking his brother's wife for himself, but as John goes along explaining the concept he makes us, that is, all the generations that have come after him, realize that when we deal with <coughs> repentance, repentance must come before forgiveness. It can't be the other way around. There's something unwise in supposing that a person can enjoy the fruits of forgiveness of sins while still resisting or merely remaining ignorant of repentance. It doesn't work that way. Sincere repentance must come first. It tops the list. Matthew 3 continues, But when he, John the Baptist, 
saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was standing in the river, he shouted back at them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce your fruit in keeping with repentance. So there is strong evidence that repentance is thoroughly ingrained in John the Baptist's message. But what about Jesus himself? What are his first words when he began his public ministry? Matthew 4 tells us, When Jesus heard that John had, be, had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. From that point forward, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. The time has come to proclaim the good news, Jesus says in Mark 1. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Both Jesus and his cousin John make an immediate and irrefutable connection between repentance and the kingdom of God. Why? Secular scholars might claim it lies in the fact that in those days, Israel was split into two kingdoms, northern and southern. Dual citizenship was prohibited, even though the people longed for unification. That might be the worldly reason, but the gospel gives us the spiritual reason. Consider this. As citizens of the kingdom of darkness, we are not fit subjects for the kingdom of light. For as Jesus tells us, no person can serve two masters. It's either one or the other. We must repent. As citizens of the kingdom of earth, we have selfish interests and loyalties that have no place in the kingdom of God. We must repent. If we are citizens of the kingdom of evil, we cannot be admitted to the kingdom of righteousness. Again, we must repent. When we worship the kingdom of the body, we cannot fully enter the gates of the kingdom of the spirit. Not only was repentance the first word of Christ's ministry, it was also the last. We heard from our scripture from Luke 24, Thus it is written, the Messiah is to suffer and then rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin is to be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. Sounds like repentance is mentioned all over the New Testament. What about the disciples? Mark 6 tells us, that the twelve received their initial orientation, their personal training from Jesus himself. They got sent out in pairs to minister to the people. Verse 12 explains the task which their master Jesus taught them. It says, they went out to the towns around Galilee and preached that people should repent. On the first day of Pentecost, head disciple Peter stands up before a large crowd in Solomon's Hall to give a sermon. Acts 2.37 says, many new converts were eager and ready to give over their lives to Christ. And they asked, Brother Peter, what should we do? Peter answers, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Finally, we find that repentance is at the heart of the Apostle Paul's preaching as well. Going back to the book of Acts, when Paul is before King Agrippa, he says to him during his testimony, King, I have not been disobedient to the, to the vision of heaven, to those in Damascus, to those in Jerusalem, and also to the Gentiles, I have preached that people need to repent and to prove their repentance to God by their deeds. To the Athenians in Greece, Paul says, 
Since we are God's offspring, we should not think that, divine, that the divine is like gold or other images made by man's design or skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now God commands that all people everywhere need to repent. I mentioned last week how repentance is often viewed in a negative or distasteful way inside the church, almost like a necessary evil. It's painful. It's disrupting. It digs up embarrassing moments that have long been buried and forgotten. It's something to be avoided in our feel-good culture. Hardly anyone would speak of repentance as being desirable, right? But it is. What if I told you that repentance is downright joyful? Repentance is not raw, joyless self-hatred. It's blessed, beautiful God-discovery. Repentance is the experience of coming home to honesty. When we gather the courage to say, I'm sorry, I want to turn myself away from my bad behavior, we become more fully ourselves. It's because we face reality in a mature way, that we've taken responsibility. Thus, our will becomes engaged with our, with our inner sense of righteousness. And by that, we achieve freedom. You're right, repentance requires humility. Early theologian St. Augustine once wrote, Do you wish to rise? If so, begin by descending. Work downhill. You plant a tower that reaches the clouds first by laying the foundation with humility. Repentance also lays the foundation for experiencing truth. When we repent, we admit we know nothing and that it's only at that point that we can be open enough to allow ourselves for God to come in and to do what needs to be done. Repentance is synonymous with spiritual growth. The Eastern Orthodox teach that the soul is closest to God not when he or she is receiving consolations or experiencing some great miracle or wonder, not with either the high or the low, it comes, rather, when a person comes in at eye level and truly and honestly utters the words, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Prince of Peace, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's part of what is known as the Jesus Prayer. In a brand new interview that just came out in AARP magazine, Bob Dylan says, that the most beautiful words a person can sing is amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. <clears throat> At moments like that, the soul takes a great leap toward God and huddles close to God's love. Repentance not only puts the soul at rest, but it enjoys a quiet and joyful rest that lies in the radiance of divine mercy. The Bible says that heaven rejoices over one soul who is saved even more than 99 souls who already believe. The mechanism is put into place from love, belief, confession, grace, repentance, forgiveness, baptism, but the word that is used to describe it all first is repentance. The gospel's first word 